Welcome to Talking Points. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen E. Gardner, and we've been doing a series on the four pillars of faithfulness. Thus far, we've covered three of those pillars, the first one being demand, the second one desire, the third one discipline. And today we're going to open up part one of the fourth pillar, which is duty. I trust that you'll be blessed by today's lesson on the fourth pillar of faithfulness, which is duty. Duty. Performing the tasks, preserving the position, perfecting your call. So there are three P's that are associated with duty. The first P is performing the tasks, plural. The second P is preserving what? The position. And the third P is perfecting your call. Well, what does, what are some of the definitions that are associated with uh, duty? First of all, duty can be defined as obligatory tasks, conduct, service, or functions that arise from one's position as in life or in a group. Obligatory tasks, conduct, service, or functions that arise from one's position as in life or in a group. Could be something, um, some particular position that you may hold uh, on a on your job or or in, in a church or either some sort of a uh, organization. Those are those functions that arise from that position that are associated with obligatory tasks. Duty is also and can be defined as assigned service or business. Something that's been assigned to you to do or a business that you have an obligation to perform or a business that you have an obligation to, uh, to carry out. And duty can also be defined as a moral or legal obligation. Well, let us go into the scripture. And here we want to go. We want to go into the book of Philippians. And we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 uh, through 15. And here the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Philippi. And he's making some things known about what he had already predetermined about the duty or the call of God that he sought after. One thing he kept in mind is that he wanted to press toward the goal. So he says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul, first of all, says that, look, I don't consider myself to have reached the goal. But I'm pressing forward toward the goal to make it, to embrace it, to own it. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So he's pressing on to make the goal his own because Christ Jesus has made him his own. So in other words, because what Christ has done for him that becomes the impetus or the motivation to keep reaching forward, to keep reaching toward whatever that goal is, whatever that assigned task, whatever those obligatory tasks are, whatever that function that arises from your position, whatever that is, you keep moving toward it because of what Christ has done for you. The Bible lets us know that in everything we should do it as unto the Lord. And that's just not what you do in the work of the church. But those of us that have positions and functions that are outside the church, in the community, or either on secular jobs, or you run your own business, even within those tasks, we should do it 
as unto the Lord, that it should be that by my by my by my actions, by my speech, and by the way I treat my employees, or the way I treat one other staff members, or the way I treat my managers, and though that lifestyle that you be that you display in the marketplace should be the kind of lifestyle that gives God the glory because you are pressing toward the goal. You are pressing to, to exemplify and to be the best version of Christ that you can possibly be through your assigned task. So he goes on to say, Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it. You know, I don't care how many degrees we get. I don't care what kind of accomplishments we may have. I don't care how much we may have amassed through, or, uh, through our own prosperity or through our own wealth. But none of those things, you know, are, are amount to a hill of beans. We have to come to the point to where we realize I have not made it yet. Because really, the goal is not so much about success in this life. The goal is not so, so much about um you know, popularity and those kind of things where you can get the accolades from others. But the goal is about, am I doing all that God wants me to do? Am I pressing toward the things that he has already laid out before me? And what that means is this, you that know God's will and know God's purpose for your life, that becomes your craft. And in knowing your craft, you want to be the best at it. Which means that if I'm going to be good at any craft, I've got to spend time working on me, working on the person that does the work. And so part of doing the work means that am I engaged in all that pertains to my task? Well, we have a roadmap that really talks to us about the task. We have other means by which we can discern what that task is. And are we, do it, are we really good at it? And are we trying to be better at it? Don't just settle for just being good, but keep pressing to where you can become better. So Paul says here in verse 13, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So what does he mean by forgetting what lies behind. And so um, we'll come to that in just a second, but let's read on a little bit further. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So his goal was the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. His goal was the prize of the heavenly call of God and that heavenly call of God was his duty. And that was in Christ Jesus. And verse 15 says, let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too, God will reveal to us. So we that are mature should be thinking the same way, that we need to prioritize what's most important and we should become most, we should become most passionate about that which is most important. And in this case, Paul was most passionate about his heavenly calling. He was most passionate about the duty, the assigned task that God had given him and what he he wanted to finish well so that when he comes before God himself or the throne of Christ to be assessed for what he did while he was here in this dimension, he can hear Jesus say to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's something we should all be striving for. So therefore, I don't want to just live a lackadaisical life. I don't want to just barely, you know, live for God. I want to press to become better at what God has called me to do. For by doing so, 
Not only am I pleasing him, but I'm also leading the way. I'm also displaying through my own lifestyle and through my own behavior a path that others can follow, that others can emulate. We are to show others how to press toward the goal. And he goes on to make it known that he was not going to allow anything to stand in his way from pleasing the one who had called him. And so therefore we go into what I just alluded toward, forgetting what is behind. And so what does that mean? Well, the New Testament church uh, written by Redford, um, he talks about what that could mean. And he says this, he said, this could be or this could include much of the quote unquote rubbish from Paul's past, his Jewish heritage, his and cultural advantages, his sins and failures, his impressive array of accomplishments. None of these things must be allowed to divert his attention from the opportunities before him. So Paul has a list of what was in his past. On the one hand, he had those things that were of that were positive. And on the other hand, he had those things that were not so positive. His sins and failures, his misgivings, and the like. So Paul said, look, I basically am not I count all of that back there as rubbish. None of that is more important than what I'm pursuing. None of that is more important than pressing toward the goal. None of that is more important than whom I have prioritized in my life and the task of the one that I prioritize have become my duty. That's my focus. And so Paul says, I'm not going to let my Jewish heritage or my cultural advantages stand in my way. So what we can learn from that is that we shouldn't let our ethnicity, we shouldn't let the pride of how or what race or nationality we've, we've become to stand in the way of what we're pursuing in God, nor our cultural advantages. Whether you grew up on the right side of the tracks or the left side of the tracks, it doesn't matter which side of the tracks that you are on, whether you were fortunate or less fortunate, don't let those things become a hindrance toward pressing toward the goal. Because God has leveled the playing field that no matter what we have accomplished in this life or have not accomplished, we're all at the same level and we all can press toward the same goal. And so we all have to forget those things which are behind. Obviously, he said sins and failures. You know, that's huge because sometimes the thing that becomes a, uh, becomes a, uh, what's the word that I want to use? That becomes a barrier or becomes that which holds us back or that keeps us anchored and from moving forward is our past sins and our past failures, and we all have them. If we have our past sins and failures in our focus, in our vision, we're not gonna be so motivated about pressing toward the goal because our level of self-esteem has been fractured by our past misgivings, mistakes, and failures. Paul said, I'm not looking back at my sins and failures. In fact, there's another time in his epistles where he said that he was chief of sinners. And when you read his past and you read his story, we find his story, which is Christ, that's revealed to him, especially when he was on the Isle of Patmos, not on the Isle of Patmos, but rather when he was on, when he was headed uh, down to Damascus, I'm sorry, when he was headed down to Damascus and he had this vision of Christ. And he said, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? 
And he was so zealous about throwing Christians into prison and into jail. Yet, the interesting thing was about God. God saw value in his zealousness. God saw value in his zeal. And he saw that if, if I can take Paul as he is, and if he accepts me and becomes converted, the same zeal that he had in throwing Christians in prison is the same zeal he could use for my kingdom by leading as many to the same Christ that he persecuted. God looks and evaluates all that we have in our past. And he sees something there in our past that's useful. And God always resurrects that which is useful to him. So on the one hand, we may have had zeal in doing that which is wrong, but it's the zeal itself that becomes of value to God. And when we turn to God, God turns to us. And in essence, we transform and we become and are becoming the person he wants us to be. And he gives us a whole new set of tasks. He gives us another duty to perform that we are to fulfill while in this life. And what keeps us on track is looking beyond the duty and the call to the heavenly prize that God has laid out before us. So Paul said, I'm not going to let my sins or my failures, nor he's going to let his impressive array of his accomplishments to stand in the way. And we know that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, and you know he, you know he was, he was a type of person he looked was looked up to, and he was well spoken of. Yet all of the success that he had amassed was not important of what was in front of him, and so he chose to forget those things which are behind. Another thing too, in moving forward or pressing toward the goal, and that is is not so much the stuff that's in our past, but the stuff that's in our present. Sometimes current relationships and affiliations be can become a distraction. Sometimes things can become a distraction, whether it be social media or whether it be some other, you know, interest in life that you are presently engaged in can become a distraction from you pressing toward the goal. So we have to make qualitative decisions about what we choose to uh, have us. And who has us is the one that we should choose to have. And the one that has us is the one that Paul says, he's made me his own, so I'm going to make him my own. Then he says these, then the things that we can find out here are these. Part of pressing toward the goal it says in that verse that let us then who are mature be of the same mind. Well, all of us who are mature, what does that mean? Grown men as opposed to children. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. And 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, it says, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, uh, NASB, and it says, brethren, do not, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. Okay? Then we find in Ephesians 4.13. In Ephesians 4.13, it says these words, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And lastly, we can look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, and it says these words, 
want to I want to read before that because there's some important stuff here and this is what he says in verse 11 and he says about this we have much to say that is hard to explain since you have become dull of understanding for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God you need milk, not solid food. For everyone that lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But now he gets into those who are mature. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained to practice to distinguish good from evil. So he gives an, you know, he went on to kind of explain, you know, that they still, they, he was really admonishing them for not being mature, that they ought to be the point that they should be teaching, but they needed someone to teach them again because why? They were still on milk and not solid food. They were still immature in their thinking, they were still childish in how they behave themselves. And so those who are mature should think like a mature person thinks. And so therefore, and here I'm kind of alluding toward another verse in Galatians 3, or Galatians 4, 3 through 4, it says, they are therefore those who have passed out of the rudimentary disciplines of ordinances, or 1 Corinthians 13, 10, that says, who have put away childish things who have assumed the apostles' views about the law. In fact, mature and spiritual are the same. You can go to 1 Corinthians uh, 2 and 6, and we'll find that um, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, we'll see a comparison between 1 Corinthians 2 and 6 and 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 and 2 and 6 says these words, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Verse 3, verse 1 says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. And he goes on to talk about there is strife among them and saying I'm of this person and I'm of that person. And we see that type of partyism we see today how people rally around a person or a personality over against whom we should rally around, which is what Paul talked about with Jesus, Jesus, which is Jesus Christ. These men that he was talking about here were proud of their manhood, who boasted their spiritual discernment and often gave no thought to the scruples of others, even the lacks in their own life. Well, tell me that doesn't speak today that these men were proud of their manhood and boasted their spiritual discernment and often gave no thought to the scruples of others and even the lacks in their own lives. So we have to evaluate ourselves to make sure that we are where we're supposed to be and that we're striving to be the best version of Christ to the world. My last passage I want to deal with today is coming from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And here we find God's reply to the prophet's complaint. And he said, I will stand up at my watch post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer, and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Uh, excuse me. What he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision 
Make it plain on tablets so that the runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it, for it surely will come. It will not delay. And so when he says to stand upon, watch, it is talking about a watch post. The prophets often compared themselves awaiting the revelations of Jehovah with earnest patience to the watchman on an eminence watching with an intent eye all that comes within view. And you've got a host of scriptures there that can see how this statement is verified. So the prophet is talking about his, his watch post. And so the watch post on the one hand could be is the withdrawal of the whole soul from earthly and fixing it on heavenly things. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. It could be, there's an accumulation of synonyms that go along with this um, watch post idea. It's stand open, watch, set me, tower, watch to see. All of these implies persevering fixity of attention. Persevering fixity of attention to watch to see, to set me upon the tower, to stand open. In other words, this person was focused. Whatever duty that we have received of God to do, or whatever we have perceived of God to perform, we have to have focus. Now, let me say this as I wrap this up today. The watch post, he said, I will stand upon my watch. In other words, this was a time and a place where he could be alone with God. They could be alone with Christ. Be alone in prayer. Be alone in the word. Be alone in some form of devotion or some form of reflection or meditation. Paul, I mean, uh, Jesus told his disciples at one time, come apart for a while and rest. And sometimes we need to separate and come apart and be alone just so to, to tune in to the vision or to the ideas and to the things that God would have us to do. That's most important. So in these cases, when that person sets down to write these visions, when that, when that, prophet sits down to write these visions, this is what we learn. In these cases, the written record of the vision serves as an official affidavit or guarantee to verify the trustworthiness of the vision's content. Later, when, though, when the events have come to pass, the document provides indisputable confirmation of the truthfulness of the prophetic revelation. Well, if that work for the prophet. It works for those who follow the Christ. Spend time with God. Get alone with him. Write down what he tells you. Note the date that he told you. When it comes to pass, you got a written record that kind of further confirms what you've heard and what you've read. And that also strengthens your faith and your walk with God as you seek to carry out the duty and the assignments that he's laid before you. May God bless you. I trust you've been blessed by today's lesson. Come back with us next week as we will deal with duty part two. God bless you.